Hello everyone. Let us come to the next part of my series of operative neurosurgery. As many of my students have requested me, I will be teaching about the operative neurosurgical procedures which are done as an emergency. These procedures are important because of two things. These are all emergencies and life-saving procedures. So you need to be as rapid as possible, but at the same time, you need to be as meticulous as possible. So let us discuss these things in detail. In this particular session, let us speak about a decompressive craniectomy for various neurosurgical emergencies. Okay, without wasting much of our time, let us directly delve into our topic, decompressive craniectomy. So let me start sharing my PowerPoint. So I'll be speaking regarding decompressive craniectomy for intracranial hypertension stroke. I will also discussing and discuss regarding storage of the bone flap in the abdominal fat layer. So let me start the presentation. So before I go into the operative procedure, let us discuss regarding the classical indications. There are two classical indications for decompressive craniectomy. So, so the first indication is traumatic brain injury. Traumatic brain injury where the midline shift is more than 0.5 mm. There are signs of uncle herniation. There is obliteration of the basal systems. In this picture, you can see there is, this is a traumatic brain injury with a small hemorrhage in the right frontal hemisphere. But in the edema is out of proportion to the bleed and there is a midline shift to the opposite side. The second classical indication is an infarct. Uh, is a stroke. It may be a hemorrhagic infarct or a bleed or an ischemic stroke. So here you can see a right, sorry, the last picture was a left-sided bleed. Here you can see a right-sided stroke. It's a well-defined impact in the right-sided territory, frontotemporoparietal fronto region. This is causing a midline shift to the opposite side by more than 5 mm. So these are the two classical indications. One is traumatic brain injury. Other thing is, is a stroke, either ischemic or an hemorrhagic stroke. So these are our two classical indications for decompressive craniectomy. Now coming to the procedure proper. As, as in any other procedure, position is very important. So what are the important things in positioning for decompressive craniectomy? First one, I may use, either I can place the head supported on a three pin headrest where it's a rigid fixation, or because it's an emergency, I personally prefer to keep it with the help of a headrest. So here I've shown a three pin headrest. Most important is you rotate the head to the opposite side. It's preferable to head the rotate in such a way that the midline of the head, as shown in the picture, is parallel to the ground, parallel to the table. So this is our operating table. So the midline is parallel to the operating table. This is preferable. But if you are not able to rotate the head to the opposite side by 90 degrees, then at least 60 degrees is required. To facilitate mm -hmm. this head rotation, depending on the body habitus of the patient, flexibility of the neck, you can use a rolled up pillow or a shoulder rest. We use a sandbag in our setting. So you can use it of appropriate thickness so that the torso rotates a bit. A bit. The uh, ipsilateral shoulder is raised up a bit so that you can easily rotate the head to the opposite side. While achieving this one, while achieving this rotation of 90 degrees, ensure that there is no excessive twist. There should be no excessive twisting of the neck.
This is because of obvious reasons. If the patient has cervical spondylosis, if there is canal stenosis, it can cause neuro neurological deficit. And more than that, if there is compression on the jugular vein, it will cause excessive bleeding during surgery. So you will have to ensure that there is no excessive twisting of the neck. Second important point, how do you place the three pins of the three pin headrest? I usually place the single pin on the frontal side and two pins on the occipital side. Not exactly as shown in the picture. I place the single pin on the frontal side on the contralateral mid pupillary line, somewhere over here. I ensure that I place it at least an inch above the supraorbital ridge. This is for two things. If I place it in the middle, I may enter into the superior sagittal sinus if I penetrate the skull, which is catastrophic. Secondly, if I place it just above the supraorbital ridge, there is every chance that I can enter into the frontal sinus. So I place it in the mid pupillary line on the opposite side, about an inch above the supraorbital ridge. And coming to the remaining two pins in the occipital side, I place, uh, we will have to place the two pins straddling the midline. If you place it on the midline, again, the reason is same thing. You are going to, you may penetrate the skull causing injury to the superior sagittal sinus. And they should be above the transfer sinus because below the external occipital protuberance, which corresponds to the transfer sinus, the, the occipital bone is thin. And one more word of caution, ensure that this pin is as away from the incision site as possible. If it is too near to the incision site, it may compromise the posterior extent of our incision. So let's go to the next one. So I'm pretty sure that you are very clear with the positioning. And one more point, make sure the head end is above the heart level. Head end should be greater than the heart level. This is to prevent excessive bleeding during surgery. Coming to the skin incision. Coming to the skin incision, we take a falconer incision. The falconer incision is a cushion shaped incision. The starting part of the incision, the beginning point is just one centimeter in front of the tracus, just above the zygomatic arch. So this is our zygomatic arch which you can palpate in our body on, on, the, on the patient's head. This is the tragus. So above the zygomatic arch, around one centimeter in front of the tragus, I start my incision. I go parallel to the tragus, go up, just above the pinna, I take a posterior superior turn, go back sufficiently backwards to involve the parietal eminence, and then go forward and reach and end at the level of the hairline. And now, I, what is the distance from the midline? I take this incision, ensuring a distance of one to 1.5 centimeters from the midline. But some people take it until the midline, that is up to you. But I prefer to take around one to 1.5 centimeters from the midline. Second decision which you have to take is, what is the posterior extent of the incision? 